Okay, we're going to start chapter 5, and we're going to basically go through an entire book of the Bible today. So go ahead, and we're going to start with, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll do glory be, so glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So this is the second book of the Bible. We just went through Genesis. Now we're going to go through the second book, Exodus. And that one's going to cover mostly Moses, the Ten Commandments. So we got a lot to get through. So we start off with the people. When we last left, the Israelites had all moved by the hundreds of thousands down into Egypt because Joseph had the advisor to the Pharaoh had helped so much that he was allowed to bring his entire family down to Egypt to save them from the famine. So again, all these people moved down there. But of course, gratitude has a short memory. And sure enough, after a couple you know, generations, the Egyptians forgot why they were so grateful to these Hebrew people. And they started becoming indignant that these immigrants were in their country. So um, as many people do who have bad memories, they decided to just enslave the entire race of the Israelites. So now, of course, the Hebrew people who were perfectly legitimate to be there, but at the same time were resented by the other people later, um, are now waiting for their Messiah, their chosen one, and to come and free them from this slavery that they've been impo that's been imposed upon them. So now they're waiting to get out of this, but they're not thrilled. So they're waiting. So now we go to Moses. Moses was born to a Hebrew woman. And this was in the time when, now remember back when Abraham was promised that his descendants were going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Well, we start to see this with the Hebrew people because the Hebrew people start having many children and they start to flourish and grow. Even as slaves, they have so many family members, so many people that are growing. They're just they're growing and growing. And so the Pharaoh at the time decided this was annoying. So he said, I'm going to control this population growth by just killing all of the sons born to the Hebrew women. So in his thought process, he decided this was a good way to go. So when Moses' mother had Moses, she was like, I don't want him to die. So she hatches a plan to go ahead and build a waterproof basket and place her baby in it and float him down the Nile. Now she knows that the Nile is going to kind of float him down to the area of the palace where the women at the time would go out to bathe. So she has her daughter Miriam go out and watch little baby Moses in the water and sure enough his basket floats down to their bathing area and the wife of Pharaoh sees little baby in the basket. She gets all excited to be. So she goes and she picks up the baby and she goes, he will be mine now. So she raises him with all the other foster babies in the palace who were up there. So along with um, the son of Pharaoh and some of the other royalty boys there, Moses gets raised up right alongside him. But at the same time, he's a baby. So um, they look for someone to take care of baby Moses. So Miriam says, I know somebody, goes and grabs Moses' mother and says, this lady can take care of him until he's old enough to be on his own. And they're like, perfect. So Moses' mother actually gets to raise Moses for the first little bit of his life. So once he's old enough, he starts to become a member of the palace and everything, and he's living with them and growing up like them. Um, he was So he was basically a foster son to Pharaoh and very much raised in the palace at that time. But one day Moses is out and he sees an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrew slaves to death. And Moses is like, that's not okay. So he goes out and he kills the Egyptian. Well, the problem was, even though he was, you know, it was back then, it was eye for an eye. So because Moses had killed this man, he was now going to be put to death for killing an Egyptian. Because they, in the Egyptians' mind, all the Egyptian people were like sons of the gods. So it was like a big deal to kill an Egyptian descended from the gods. So Moses runs off into the desert at the time. And he comes upon a tribe that's out in this land of Midian. And he ends up staying. He ends up marrying one of the daughters and becomes a shepherd for a while. And he's happy raising his sheep and living in this big tribe family. And for a long time, he's good. And these people, you know, are good people. So he's happy. Until one day there's a lost sheep. And Moses goes out to look for this sheep. And 
he goes up and he ends up going to the top of a mountain. And this is where he finds the burning bush. And it's a bush that is on fire, but no matter how long the fire burns, the bush isn't consumed. So it's not burning up, it's not turning into ash. It's just on fire. And Moses approaches this bush and that's when God speaks to him and tells him that he is now in the presence of God, so remove his sandals, he's in holy land. And Moses does and talks to him, and this is when God reveals uh, his plan for Moses, and Moses is going to free the people and says, you're going to do this, and I'm going to give you what you need to do this, so you're not going to be alone, but you're going to do it. And Moses is like, okay. So God reveals his name too. He says, my name is Yahweh, which means I am. So that's, he's, I am, I am. And so that's one of the ways that the um, Hebrew people will then refer to God later on. And so very succinct, very just short, I am. That is who I am. And so Moses goes back and starts to try to convince Pharaoh that now it's time to let the Israelites go and they need to go home and you're done using their slave labor and it is over. And Pharaoh, of course, is like, ha, no, I knew you. We grew up because it's now one of the brothers that, that um, Moses had grown up with. So the old Pharaoh has now passed. New Pharaoh's there. Moses is trying to convince new Pharaoh to let the, sl the slaves go. Pharaoh's like, I'm not having any of that. They're going to work even harder. So Moses says, no, you need to let them go. And he performs several miracles. But the problem with some of these miracles is they can be duplicated with magic in a way. So even though, so one of the things Moses does, he throws his staff down on the floor and it turns into a snake. And so the Pharaoh brings over his magicians and says, do it. So they throw their staffs down on the floor and they also turn into snakes. And Pharaoh's like, see, it's just a magic trick. You're not fooling me. But while he's not really paying attention, Moses' staff snake ends up eating the staff snakes of the other two magicians and then turns back into a staff. So they're like, huh. But Ramses is like, nope, not letting you guys go. Just go move on, leave. And Moses says, okay, then I'm going to send, have God send the first plague. And the first plague comes and it turns all of the water into blood. So the Nile River, which is, you know, the first or second biggest river in the world, depending on what the Amazon's doing at the time, turns into blood. You've got the water in the wells in land turning into that. You've got the water in the pitchers. You've got everything. So this is a problem for a while because, of course, you don't have anything to drink. Nothing. Everything has turned into like blood. So there, that's messed up. So then these, this sets off a whole series of other plagues. You've got the water turns into blood. You've got the plague of frogs where you can't take a step without squishing one. You've got the plague of lice, which are really annoying little you know bugs that are going to infest your hair and skin. You've got the plague of flies. And I don't know if you've ever been bitten by a fly, but it actually hurts. Um, there's some big flies that you can find. Um, disease of the cattle, of course, which is a problem because if you're relying on cattle for milk and meat and then they just die, you're left with nothing. Um, boils, which are giant blobs of pus that appear all over your body and they hurt and they're, you know, so they're now you're like you're covered in basically giant chicken pox that itch and hurt and are painful. Uh, hail, which came and destroyed the rest of their crops and some of that hail was on fire, which didn't help. The plague of locusts, which are these giant grasshopper things that come in literally everything. And they don't just eat plants. They eat like your any cloth, any baskets made out of reeds, that everything, everything plant material, gone, wiped out. And then you get the plague of darkness, where darkness descends over the land for several days. Now, these are the first nine plagues. And one of the interesting things about these plagues is that they are in direct correlation to some of the fake gods that the Egyptians worshipped at this time. So the plague of blood corresponded to, um, you know, by defiling the river Nile, it in a way uh, proved that their god of the Nile wasn't powerful. Um, by the plague of darkness, it was proving that their god of sun was not more powerful than the Hebrew god. So each of these plagues was basically disproving that these Egyptian gods actually had any power or even existed. So that was a nice th another thing that God was trying to show. I am more powerful, not even more powerful, but I am real. These other gods are not. So he was making a very good point here. Now, 
So each one of these times, then afterwards, Moses would go to Pharaoh and say, all right, this other plague happened. Are you ready to let these people go yet? And Pharaoh would be like, nope, not ready, not willing. And so it said in the Bible that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, so he wouldn't allow these people to go. And so finally Moses goes up to them and, and the Pharaoh and says, all right. Now at the time, the Pharaoh was even considered to be a god. He was the god on earth at the time. And so the last plague, of course, is going to be the death of the firstborn son. And he says, please don't let this come to pass. This is horrible. Just let the people go. And Pharaoh's like, nope, not going to happen. They're going to be my slaves. And so this next plague comes with the angel of death coming to pass over all of the land of Egypt. And then, sure enough, killing the firstborn son which was, again, a big deal because this is the next pharaoh would have been like one of the gods. It was a big deal. Um, <clears throat> so it's a judgment on all of that, that pharaoh, those, the, you know, pharaoh pretending to be a god, all of that stuff. And in addition, um, it's mirroring how the father before him had went ahead and killed all of the baby boys that were born to the he Hebrews. Um, it's prefiguring how later on Herod is going to have all of the Hebrew boys killed when in the time of Jesus when Jesus is born um, prefiguring how Jesus the Son of God is going to sacrifice himself so there's a lot a lot of symbolism in this final plague but finally the angel of so this is that last plague that angel of death coming so the angel of death is then sent over the land and the Hebrew people are like You've just, we're supposed to free us. And so far you've made us have bloody water, frogs, lice, boils, our cows are dying. How is this helping anybody? And so they're like, now you're going to kill our firstborn son? What kind of savior are you, Moses? So Moses is like, yeah, let's talk about this. So God has given him a plan. Everyone who is loyal to God is going to follow this plan. And it's going to be called the Passover. So on the night of the final plague, God gives the Hebrews a command. What their job to do to show God that they are loyal to him, they're going to have a special dinner, a Passover dinner. And they're going to take an unblemished lamb and they're going to cook it for dinner and they're going to share it as a family and eat it along with a special dinner of unleavened bread, which if you ever have, like, tortillas are unleavened. Okay? They're flat. They're just bread, but they're flat. If you get like a yeast roll or a biscuit or a bolillo or something like that or a donut, that's leavened bread. That's all puffy and fluffy. And that is, it's been risen with yeast and things like that. So, but it takes time. You make yeast rolls or something like that. They need time to grow. A tortilla, you mix it up, you know, flat thing. You put it in the, you really quick griddle it and it's a flat bread. It's not leavened. It's not risen. So unleavened bread takes just a couple minutes to prepare and cook, whereas leavened bread takes some time to grow. So this is symbolic of how fast they're going to have to be. They're going to have that special dinner. They're going to roast the lamb. They're going to have unleavened bread. They're going to eat it. And when they eat this dinner, they're going to have shoes on their feet. Their bags are packed, ready to go. Just woof this thing down before they have to run away to get out of there. So it's like get ready to go kind of dinner. And now what they're going to do is the, with the blood of the lamb that they have had for dinner, they're going to take that blood and they're going to mark their doorways with it, their lintels, the doorway, or the part around the door. They're going to mark their doorways with it to show that they have listened to God. They did what he, what he asked them to do. They're following directions, and so they're going to mark it. Now, this will allow the angel of death to recognize that in this household, there are people who are listening to God and the angel of death will then pass over that household and no one in it will suffer. The firstborn son will not be killed. So that was a very important meal for them. And again, they're getting ready to go because after this hits the Pharaoh, they need to go. So again, and this is much prefiguring. Jesus is the Lamb of God. His blood is going to allow death and sin to pass over their house. Much, much symbolism in this. Now, after this, after Pharaoh's son succumbed to the angel of death, Pharaoh was just absolutely devastated and said, fine, leave, get out. And that's why they were get with their shoes on their feet and bags packed, ready to go, because they were ready to go. So they start getting ready, loading up everything. But again, thousands of people, lots of stuff, animals, you know, material possessions, households, they had to pack up and leave. 
So they start to leave, but then Pharaoh's like, wait a minute. These people, it's because of them that my son died. So he gets angry. So he sends his armies out, and he's like, you know what? Just kill them all. Just slaughter them. Kill them all. So now the people have started to leave, but now they're caught between Pharaoh's armies and the Red Sea, which is a significant amount of water. You can't just swim over that really fast and all their stuff and everything. So now they're caught between a big thing of water and the armies and they panic and they look to Moses and they're like, after this, is God going to just let us die? Which you think they would know better by now, but nope, they still complain. So they look to Moses and God sends a major wind down and he parts the Red Sea. So he basically parts the water, spreads it across and the the uh, Hebrew people are then allowed to easily and quickly walk through with giant walls of water on either side of them, walk across the Red Sea to the other side, and be safe. And now, um, now, so the Egyptian armies are following along, see this, and are like, all right, let's do it. So they follow in after them, and as soon as they start to follow in after them, the walls of water come in and drown them and crush them. Had they just turned around and said like, okay, obviously God wants them to live, we're done, it would have been fine. But no, they were still intent on following these people and slaughtering them. So because they decided to follow these people and slaughter them, God's like, nope. And then the waters come in and, you know, they drown. So the Hebrews are now free people. The Pharaoh's done with them. He's like, don't ever come back. The Hebrew people are fine. They're wandering off into the, they're heading out to the desert, trying to go back to their homeland. So now they're free. They're their own people. They are beholden to no one. They're no longer slaves. And they start to complain. That's their first thing they do. They're like, ah, now we're whining. So they start complaining because now they're walking back through the desert to their homeland, the Exodus. But it's hot. And there's not a lot of stuff there. So they start to complain. There's no food. We're tired. We're hot. We're hungry. We're thirsty. Nah, 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 nah. You'd think they'd just be like, oh, our God has saved us. Now we're good. We're going to go back to our homeland. Nope. They immediately start to whine. So God's like, Ugh, okay, fine. So he has Moses perform the miracle where he strikes a rock and a giant deluge of water comes out to the point where it's like forming like a giant lake kind of thing for them to get their fresh water from. And he also sends flocks of quail every night to come and they can have meat. And he also sends them something called manna, which is like a bread from heaven. So every morning they go out and they be able to gather this bread kind of substance off the ground and they gather it up and each person no matter how much they got every day they get back home and every person would have the exact amount that they were supposed to have and God said here's what's gonna happen I'm gonna give this to you every day trust me I will give it to you every day and then on the seventh day when you're supposed to rest I'm going to make whatever you had that that sixth day it's gonna last all day but he goes, if on like Monday you try to hoard it so you don't have to get up the next day and go out to work and get your food, it's going to go bad. And so sure enough, if they tried to gather too much or tried to save it for the next day so they didn't have to wake up and do their work, it would go bad and wormy and gross and rot. But on that sixth day, whatever they had was more than enough to last them to the seventh day. So no matter what, God's like, trust me. I will provide for you, but you have to trust me. So it would go bad if they tried to skirt the rules, but God always took care of them, even though they whined a lot. So now, okay, so these people have been slaves for a long time. They've been slaves under the Egyptians, and the Egyptians, one of the problems with that was that they had gods for everything. They had the god of the Nile, the god of the air, the god of the sun, the god of the sky, the god of you know, everything. They had gods, 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 everything. God's like, there's one God, it is me, and you're going to listen. So he's like, all right, so Moses needs some help because they're complaining a lot all the time. So he goes up to the nearby mountain to pray. And this is when he gets the Ten Commandments. But Moses gets a lot more than the Ten Commandments. He gets a ton of laws. And so now what he does is after he gets all this, he's been with God and he's been up there for like a month. Now they can see him, they can hear all this thunder and rumbling and clouds up at the top because God is communicating with Moses, but they start to get irritated. And so they talk to Moses' brother Aaron and they're like, Aaron, no one's paying attention to us. We're lonely. Uh, where's God? He's not here. Um, we need a new God. So again, that was the problem. They knew that they had all these gods back in Egypt and they were letting these Egyptian things influence them. So like, let's make a god for while Moses is gone. So they gather up all the gold that they had, their bracelets and earrings and whatnots, gathered up, melted them down and formed it into a golden calf. 
And then they start running around worshiping this golden calf like a god. So Moses comes down, and he's just like, seriously? We just watched ten plagues happen, and now you're worshiping a golden calf that you guys made out of metal. What is wrong with you? He gets so mad that the ten commandments that he had on the rocks that God had written for him, he throws those down, they get broken, because he's just irritated as I'll get out. He says, all right, either you worship the God who led you out of slavery, parted waters for you, you know, all these things. That, how can, he's sending you food every night. You can either worship him or you can die. This is, this is it. I'm done. And so he says, everyone who's willing to worship God, you're fine. If you won't, you're dead. So they go out and they slaughter all the people who say, nope, I refuse to worship the God that led me out of slavery. And so those people don't get to be part of the Hebrew life anymore because they've rejected God. So they're killed. So then we move on. So now in addition to the Ten Commandments, Moses had been up there for a long time. And he'd received gods. And you have to remember these he Hebrew people had been slaves for so long, they didn't have any governing body. They didn't have any rules or laws. They were beholden to whatever the Egyptian people, the Pharaoh, had decided what the law was. So they needed some rules. They needed, basically, they needed to start a whole new governing body. And God is like, this is what you're going to do. So he gave them the Ten Commandments were a good base foundation, right? It covers basically everything. And then he says he gave them a bunch of other laws. In addition to that, he instructed them how to build the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, very nice box that was going to house the Ten Commandments. And in addition to that, God had them take a jar and fill it up with some of the manna. And that one didn't go bad either because God had, you know, he said, okay, this one's going to stay. So they could remember. So again, now we have um, all these things. They put them in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, how to design the tent that would then house, so basically like a movable giant church. Um, also how to settle their disputes, how marriage laws, worshiping laws, cleanliness laws, property laws, food, uh, health, everything. So God basically laid down the law for everything and said, this is how you're going to do it. And a lot of these, like I said, were for their own safety. As a parent, you wouldn't let your child run out into traffic or eat whatever they find under the kitchen sink. Same thing with God. He's like, all right, you guys are going to need some guidelines to get started. And then, you know, you need something because they had nothing. They were just wandering around crazy. They just made a cow out of gold and were worshiping it. So obviously they needed some help. And another thing to point out here is that they'd taken this jar of manna and put it in. So you know how we encourage people to do adoration of the Eucharist. Um, this holy bread that was sent down the heavens from God was included right next to the holy text that God had written in the Ten Commandments for the people. So again, we have this, um, starting in the Jewish faith, we have them reverencing this holy bread. Again, this unleavened bread, this holy bread that was sent from God. So this is, again, prefiguring of the Eucharist, too. So now, okay, we've got everything else. So God's getting really tired of this people. They keep having trouble. They keep whining. They keep complaining. It's getting kind of funny after a while. God finally says, enough. I'm, I'm, I'm done with some of you guys. He says, what's going to happen is you guys are not going to make it to the promised land because you are so corrupted. You are so still following these Egyptian laws and rules. None of you are going to make it to the promised land. Your kids are. So God has them wander in the desert. For 40 years, they have to wander around in the desert with their quail and their manna and their, you know, um, group of people. And they're no longer allowed to reach. So 40 years is about the time it would take for all of those adults who had grown up with the Egyptian rule and were still beholden to those Egyptian gods and laws to basically pass away and be gone. So for 40 years, they have to wander in the desert. And after about 40 years, they finally, so everyone, all the old people have died off. Except for Moses and I believe his brother, but don't quote me on that one. So they're allowed to basically see the promised land. But here's the other problem. Moses screws up too eventually. He goes out and he's trying to um, get one of the rocks again. To, God said, I will give you water. Go to the rock and ask the rock to give you water and it's going to give you water. So Moses goes up to the rock and starts praying for it to give it water, but he gets frustrated and he takes a stick and he hits it. And God's like, that's enough. I said, don't hit it. I said, ask nicely. So now he's like, you're not going to make it to the promised land either. Everyone, you'll get to see it because you did a lot of work, but you're not going to get to live there. I'm just done with you guys. So all of these kids now have grown up with the Hebrew God, understanding God is God. 
they've they basically eliminated all of the outside negative influence of the Egyptian people because remember they did the sacrifices they did the weird gods they had all these problems so God's like I need that gone so that you grow up worshiping me because obviously you keep straying you keep whining you keep complaining so eventually they make it to the promised land that land of Israel and they get back there and so for 40 years and Moses doesn't even get to actually set foot in it he just gets to see it and then he passes away and they bury him so now the Egyptian people are no, excuse me now the Hebrew people they're now home so they have finally arrived to their home of Israel but the problem is it was a really nice piece of land so they find out that other tribes have moved in during their absence so God helps them to get those tribes out push them out win the battles and say nope this is our land you're gonna leave and so they have to go out and God once again helps them to win all these battles and the Israelites are now living in Israel so now we move to the point now they've come home the Israelites who are worshiping the one God who called himself I am Yahweh they are now home so that is the that is the basically the story of Exodus trimmed down to probably like 20 minutes but still that's a whole book in the Bible so now we're gonna move on we're gonna go okay chapter 5 quiz is two parts so we're gonna start with the short answer one so the first short answer is what is the name of God that he revealed to Moses and what does it mean so we mentioned this earlier in the PowerPoint the name of God was Yahweh which is spelled like that and it means I am so let's go ahead and put that in quotations I am okay so those were the two parts uh, number two what is the journey of the Jews from slavery in Egypt to life in the promised land called and this is the second book of the Old Testament and again we mentioned this one this journey is called the Exodus so the second book of the Old Text of uh, the Old Testament the Exodus okay and so Exodus means leaving usually. All right, number three, when God renewed his covenant through Moses, what two things did he require of his people? We kind of talked about one of the first ones. Um, one of the first things that he required of them was that they follow the Ten Commandments. So follow the Ten Commandments. And then the second one that he asked was that they perform animal sacrifices. And the reason for this was because one of the few, they didn't really have money or anything like that. The only thing of value that they really had was their livestock, their animals. Your riches were counted by how many animals you had. So uh, by sacrificing an animal to God, you were showing that you were willing to give up some of your riches to go to God. So um, animal sacrifice. And again, the lamb is going to prefigure uh, the sacrifice of the lamb is going to prefigure Jesus dying on the cross the lamb of God um, again notice that it's not people sacrifice God does not want people sacrificed and that was one of the things that um, Egyptians did oh you're not gonna do that now animal sacrifice number three okay so but anyway that was one of the things the Egyptians did that God was trying to get rid of get that out of the people so what is an offering to God of something that is precious to us? So we just talked about that. It's called sacrifice, to give up something. Okay, an offering to God of something that is precious to you. And again, their form of money was basically animals. And so our form of sacrifice could be other things. It could be giving up our time. Um, it could be giving up like time playing video games or on the computer to spend with God. It could be uh, work. It could be just giving up time to pray. So those are also acceptable sacrifices. Consecrated, number five. Consecrated means to be what? And I'm going to quote directly here. Um, to be set apart for God. So it is set apart for God. This thing is consecrated, which means it is only to be used specifically for God's work so set apart for God so when a thing is consecrated like the chalice that we use at mass we're not going to use that later on as a drinking cup that thing is set apart for God the tabernacle we're not going to use that as a safe for like papers and things that is only to be used for the Eucharist so it is set apart for God so when things are consecrated you can also consecrate people they are set apart for God so now we didn't really talk about this one, but I'll talk about it. What did God's people want to rule over them so they could be like other nations? 
The Hebrew people wanted a king. They wanted a king. God's like, you don't want a king. You're going to have trouble with the king. And they're like, no, we want a king. We want to be like everybody else. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. Give us a king. And we know that the Hebrews like to whine a lot. So they're like, give us a king. Give us a king. So that's what we're going to get into in the next chapter. But that's what they wanted. They wanted to be like everybody else. They didn't want to just follow the law. They wanted a king. So that is what they kept asking for. Number seven, what is the act of pouring oil on something or someone as a sign that the person is chosen by God? So that is called anointing, where you are anointed with oil to set you apart. This is going to happen a lot. You're going to see it with um, when David is chosen as king. You see it when you get confirmed. You are then have oil placed on your forehead in the sign of a cross. You are anointed at your baptism. Um, literally, uh, Jesus the Christ means the anointed one. So we're you know we're really getting into it. So anyway, the uh, it's anointing. I always spell this wrong. Nope, I got it right. Okay, only the one in. Okay, now we're going to move on to the... Alright, so this is going to be an actually really important part that I want you to get in there right. So, we're going to talk about how the Passover, that dinner that Moses had where they had to have the lamb and have their sandals on their feet ready to head out, is prefiguring or giving like hints to what's coming about the Eucharist. So number one, the Paschal Lamb was sacrificed. So how is that talking about the Eucharist and the Paschal Lamb being sacrificed? So what that is prefiguring, what that is talking about, is that later on, um, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is going to be sacrificed to the Father, okay? So that's where it is. So Jesus, the Lamb of God, And then, okay, so that is this one. Jesus, the Lamb of God, will be offered to the Father, okay? And that's what happens during Mass. All right, so number two, something happened at the Passover, uh, prefigured that we are invited to receive Jesus' body and blood in Holy Communion. So in the Passover, the corresponding information for that one was that um, the Israelites ate the Paschal Lamb as a family, okay? Whoops. All right. So they ate the lamb. Now we consume the Eucharist, okay? Number three. Something happened at the Passover, and then what is that prefiguring of as Jesus' blood is sacramentally shed to save us from hell? So, what is the prefiguring part of that? And I'm just going to, I'm going to make sure I get this in here right. The Israelites sprinkled the blood of the lamb on their doorposts to mark them, okay? So... So the Israelites marked themselves, their family, their door with the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' blood is shed to save us from hell. So they were saved from death. So by marking themselves with the blood of the Lamb, we're going to be saved from sin and from hell. Now, number four, the Israelites were slaved, or the Israelites were saved from slavery to the Egyptians. So what does that what how does that correspond so number four is we are saved from slavery to sin and death okay so that's the whole point of this you uh, this exercise at the bottom is to compare things that happen in the passover to things that happen during the mass with the eucharist okay so again that prefiguring, a lot of prefiguring in the Bible. This happened because this is going to happen, okay? So that is the end of chapter 5. Yep, chapter 5, okay? So we end with, in the name of the Father and of the Son.